V6s, V8s, V10s, V12s, even V16s. They're all freaking awesome. But what about that one engine layout that always seems to miss out when it comes to cars? Where the hell are all the V4s? To take things back to basics, I've got one here and I've stripped it. So to begin with, what is a V4? Well, let's start with the most famous four-cylinder engine of them all, an inline four. It's the most popular engine layout in the car world, four cylinders in a straight line. It's reasonably balanced, it's tightly packaged, and they can create good power if tuned or boosted correctly. A V4 takes an inline four and splays the cylinders out into a V formation, two cylinders on each bank. The angle of the banks depends on the manufacturer. This engine here is a 60 degree V, while Lancia pioneered a narrow angle 20 degree V4 that was tight enough only to have a single cylinder head. In Volkswagen's peak, that would be a VR4. Traditionally, the bank angles are 90 degrees. V4 engines are almost exclusively found in the motorbike world, the peak of which being Ducati's 1000cc V4 that they use in their Superleggera V4 bike. This thing revs to 16,500 RPM and puts out 234 brake horsepower. That is a lot of performance for a one litre naturally aspirated engine. Google V4 engine bikes and you'll see Ducatis, Aprilias, Yamahas, Hondas, Nortons. The V4 is a well-trodden engine layout in the two-wheeled category. But for us car guys, we don't have much experience with them at all. So what do they sound like? Not bad. What are good things about a V4? Well, it's great for packaging. It's nice, short, and compact. That's because it's only two cylinders in length. That also means the crankshaft is nice and short, which means it can take more power. If it was longer, it's more susceptible to twisting under high torque. So being nice and short, you can rev it faster and create more power. The crankcase is also better at managing its airflow, which means there's less pumping losses, which means you convert more power from combustion through to the rear wheels. It's more efficient. The downsides, V4s can be very rattly. Just like a V8, when running, a V4 wants to rock from side to side due to having an innate imbalance within it. But compared to a V8, it's much more rattly. There's much more vibration because there's less cylinders to even out that imbalance when firing. You either put up with that imbalance or you try and engineer it out through a balancing shaft, something that this engine has. Some vibrations that V4s have created in some racing cars have been so bad that racing drivers have been coughing and losing their vision while driving due to the sheer amount of vibration coming from the engine through their bodies. Now, that engineering team managed to get around it by changing the firing order. We'll get to that car in a bit. It's a bit of a special one. You there, watching this video right now, I just wanna say, Thank you for clicking on it. Making this move, starting my own channel, has been the scariest move of my career. So I massively appreciate the fact you've seen this thumbnail and decided to click on it. Let's go on with the video. This thing doesn't have a V4. Still cool though. Hump. What is this V4 engine then? Well, it's a rarity because it's a V4 that's been made by a car manufacturer. This is the Essex V4 that was developed by Ford. It was developed alongside the Essex V6, pretty legendary engine found in the Mark I Capri. And what's really cool is they were designed to be modular, so two cylinders at a time. Hence why it's really easy to go from four to six. We're taking a quick break from filming and refueling with some Holy. I've been bad in the past at drinking those sugar-filled normal energy drinks, but this stuff has been the ideal replacement. So let's crack on with one. My favorite flavor until recently has been Raspberry Raptor Energy, but I wanna go hydration today. Let's have a go at, let's go with some white peach. You simply tear open the sachet, bung it into your water, and give it a good shake. Something I really like about Holy is it tastes exactly how it smells, and it smells phenomenal, right, white peach. 
Oh, that could be rivaling Raspberry Raptor. It's also got, according to the box, electrolytes and minerals. It's just going to keep me sharp between the ears for the rest of today's filming. Tombo, you want one as well? There you go, Raspberry Raptor. Look at him. He's loving life. Let's get it in there. I feel like Tom Cruise. All right, Tombo. How are we going to do this? Shall I come right in? Sip away at that bad boy. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, tasty. We've got plenty of this now, so let's see what the guys around here at Swallow think. Do you want to be energized or hydrated? Oh, energy. Very citrusy. <laughs> Very citrusy. Yeah, that's lovely, that is. In their starter pack deluxe, you'll get 57 sachets covering holy energy, hydration, iced tea, and milkshake, along with the standard holy shaker, and they also have these sick looking one liter thermal shakers too. If you guys want to try Holy for yourself, click the link in the description below and use my discount code FERNY5 to get five pounds off your first order and then FERNY to get 10% off any order after that. This has been my first channel sponsor and it would mean a lot if you guys went and checked them out. It will help me make bigger and better content for this channel for you guys. So if you're a guy or a girl that's big into your energy drinks, check out Holy. The SX V4 saw action in the Mark 1 Capri 2000 GT, the Marcos GT, the Ford Consul, Corsair, Granada, Zephyr Mark IV, and most famously, the Mark 1 Transit. And it was in the Transit that a big advantage of the V4 came to fruition. By being so short and stumpy compared to an inline 4, the design of the front of the van could be flat, rather than needing a big bonnet thrust out the front for a longitudinal inline 4. It's not the most powerful engine in the world. The 1.7 put out 73 brake horsepower, while this, the bigger 2-litre, put out an earth-shattering 92 brake horsepower. I say earth-shattering because these things were notoriously rattly, but that was actually the V6's fault. Let me explain. The ideal bank angle for a V4 is 90 degrees, as that means you can design the crankshaft around cylinders firing every 180 degrees, which gives the engine its best chance of self-balancing. This engine, however, Ford went for 60 degrees. That's not good for a V4. Clearly, Ford prioritized the development of the V6, which does want to sit at 60 degrees for self-balancing. So this V4 had to just put up with it. A V4 wants to be set at 90 degrees for it to accomplish primary balance, and that's why Ducati goes for a 90 degree V4 in its superbikes. It pretty much negates any need for any form of balancing shaft. My little Ford trucker here, however, definitely needs one. It's a rattly little pup. Why are V4s so rare in cars compared to inline fours? They're both four cylinder engines, but why are inline fours so popular and V4s so rare? Well, there are some disadvantages that we haven't spoken about yet. The main disadvantage of a V4 is its complexity versus an inline four. The second you splay those cylinders out, you have to double up on a lot of components. You have to double up on cylinder heads, which means you have to double up on camshafts, which means you have to double up on exhaust manifolds, and that is all very expensive to develop. We've talked about how good packaging can be with a V4. They can be nice and short, but versus an inline four, there's still a lot of competition. If you were to mount both engines longitudinally under the bonnet, you're taking up a lot of volume that could be used for mounting ancillaries. An inline four, on the other hand, keeps it super simple. You've got intake one side, exhaust the other, and loads of space to mount alternators, water pumps, whatever you want. Lancia got around it by making the V super narrow angle and only having one cylinder head, but even that wasn't enough to make the V4 a viable solution for a lot of car manufacturers. With all of that in mind, why do bike manufacturers use V4s to this day? Well, as I've said before, when set at 90 degrees, they are in primary balance, which means they have nice smooth power delivery. That also means you can rev them nice and high without having to worry too much about it shaking itself apart. A good thing on a bike. Also, being only two cylinders in length, you can package them really nicely into a much shorter length of chassis compared to an inline four. And compared to other bike engine layers like a twin or triple, you can get four cylinders into roughly the same amount of space, which means you have more potential for power and spread that power over more cylinders. V4 engines in cars then. Ford, Lancia and Saab. That's pretty much it. There is another though the big boy, 
the chosen one. One V4 engine to rule them all. The story goes that back in the noughties, Porsche started from complete first principles when designing their new Le Mans car engine. It had to be powerful to compete in the LMP1 class, but it also had to have really good packaging to incorporate a hybrid system, which all of the LMP1 cars had at that time. And being a Le Mans car, it had to be fuel efficient. Every good Le Mans car is very good on fuel. After all of this was thrown into some calculations, what was spat out the other side was a V4 engine. And here it is, one of the prettiest engines ever made. Porsche were super clever to get around the intrinsic packaging issues of a V4. That big single Garrett turbo was mounted between the banks of the engine, forming a hot V, and the hybrid system was in there too. So you've got power from that big Garrett turbo, you've got great packaging thanks to that hot V, and you've got efficiency because it was only two litres in displacement. Bingo! Porsche had created the 919's endurance racing engine, a 500 horsepower V4, by far the most powerful that layout has ever been. And we've got one in this crate. We've not got one in this crate. It's probably a couple of million quid. It's essentially a Formula One V4. Sorry. It took three victories at Le Mans, battling Audi and Toyota in LMP1, but once it was finished racing, Porsche took it to a whole other level with this, the 919 EVO. No rules or regulations, how fast could the 919 go? The answer? Faster than Formula 1. Smashing the lap time at Spa with a 1 minute 41.7, the 919 EVO was 0.7 of a second quicker than Lewis Hamilton's Mercedes F1 car, and a massive 12 seconds quicker than the race spec 919. Then came the all-time record at the Nürburgring, a 519, and one of the greatest onboard videos of all time. After this video, get it watched. Despite being a prototype race car, the 919 is actually the closest we've got to a modern V4 engined car. It's because of this thing. Back in 2020, Porsche revealed a whole load of Frankenstein project cars that never saw the light of day, and this was one of them, the 919 Street. This was a road-going version of the 919 that used the 2-litre V4 engine. Now, sadly, it's almost certainly a clay model. They never actually made one of these things. But I have talked to the Porsche press team who says there are 2-litre, 500-horsepower V4s sitting on shelves back at Porsche HQ, gathering dust. What I would give to have a mooch around those on the shelf and create some content. Heaven. But it's cool. I've got my little Ford. What to do with you? If you like the amount of engine chat in this video, give it a like and subscribe for more content just like this. I've been Mike, what's for you won't go by you, and I'll see you in the next video.